Guten Tag, A Push. We have a new video today. It's the bee's knees by the big cheese himself, Mr. Linegar. Let's make history today as we jaw over our unit six slash period seven review bid video. This covers unit six and which is period seven for the AP exam. But first let's do our daily punishment. Why did the tomato turn red? Because it saw the salad dressing. <laughs> I'm dead. Let's get started. Uh, here's the overview for period seven. It's period seven on their AP exam. It goes from 1890 to 1945. It's roughly 10 to 17% of the curriculum. It is the largest like chunk of time and usually it's tested a lot on the exam. Uh, I'll show you the numbers on the next slide. Some of the things that essays uh, could include Changes in U.S. history, like the Spanish-American War, Progressive Era, Great Depression, New Deal. Changes in continuities for immigrants, African-Americans, foreign policy during this time. Why was 1890 to 1945 chosen? 1890 was the, when you have the closing of the frontier, the Turner Thesis. This is going to lead to expansion overseas. And 1945 was chosen because of the end of World War II. This is when America will shift their foreign policy to the Cold War. This time period will focus on U.S. expansion overseas, the Progressive Era, World War I, World War II, the Roaring Twenties, Great Depression, and the New Deal. So if you look right here, here's the time period. Like I told you before, uh, our first unit uh, is... Our first unit review video was period, uh, unit one, which covered period one and two. That is probably the shortest thing that's going to be tested. All the other ones are 10 to 17%, except for the last one, which we combine these two together. P uh, period eight and period nine are uh, our next, our last re unit review video are these two periods right here. So it's actually probably the largest one. This one here does have a lot of information, uh, 1890 to 1945. You're probably going to see a good amount of questions on this unit, uh, probably more than the Gilded Age, you know, and mm, probably a little bit more than these units right here. Uh, although you definitely need to know the 1800s. It's the thing that kids struggle on the most because they forget stuff in the first semester. All right. With that being said, let's get started. Uh, what were some of the reasons for uh, America expanding overseas? The frontier was closed. The Frederick Jackson Turner thesis, American had economic economic motives for businesses, desire to increase trade. Uh, they wanted raw resources because of like industrialization. Competition with uh, European countries. So like in uh, China, China was swallowing up uh, parts of China and they were doing the spheres of influence. That's where America did the open door note where they wanted free trade. The whole idea of racial theories. So like white man's burden and social Darwinism. The first big uh, imperialist war America had in the late 1800s was the Spanish-American War. America will defeat Spain in four months. It's a cute picture right here. From this, we're gonna gain Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines. Technically, Cuba will be free, but with things like the Platt Amendment, it basically gave us permission to get involved in Cuba whenever we wanted if we didn't like their new form of government. So basically, uh, Cuba is really doing what we want, and we'll get involved in Cuba. There will be debates in America between imperialists like Theodore Roosevelt and McKinley and anti-imperialists. The Anti-Imperialist League was formed, formed by people like Williams Jennings Bryant. Uh, Andrew Carnegie joined that organization, so did Mark Twain. There will be an insurrection of the Philippines. The United States promised the Philippines independence. And once we do not give that to them, Emilio Aguilando is going to lead a insurrection against the United States until he's eventually captured. And we will not give the Philippines independence until after World War II. Uh, some of the terms for here for the foreign policy in this time period, we have like uh, Theodore Roosevelt's gunboat diplomacy, where we're kind of using force to force the uh, Asian, Latin American countries to do what we want. Uh, TR could be a little bit more discreet. He had his whole phrase, speak softly, but carry a big stick, big stick diplomacy, 
where he would he would ask for something but then use the threat of force. A good example of how he does that is the Panama Canal. You also have Taft's dollar diplomacy where they're sending money to U.S. corporations abroad. They're doing economic imperialism. Woodrow Wilson had moral diplomacy, which was me- meant to base their foreign policy on morality. But Wilson also got involved in places like Mexico and Haiti, so he didn't really live up to his ideals. Let's talk about our next part of the unit, which is the Progressive Era. This lasted mm, around 1890s all the way to 1920. Progressives tended to be urban, middle class, and women. Progressives will seek reform, so uh, so to reform society socially and politically on the local, state, and federal levels. They wanted to use the federal government to regulate certain things, like they want to regulate businesses, like monopolies. So like under Wilson, they'll pass the Clayton Antitrust Act, which is going to be a much stronger version of the Sherman Antitrust Act, and it will actually regulate monopolies. They want to regulate the economy. They want a new national bank to prevent like these banks manipulating and some of their practices. And we will get the third bus, the Federal Reserve System under Wilson. Uh, They wanted environmental laws. So we'll have the national parks being created. Theodore Roosevelt's going to be a big time conservationist. John Muir did the Sierra Club. Uh, We'll have things like the Antiquities Act and the Desert Act being passed under Theodore Roosevelt. They wanted to expand democracy. So you're going to have the initiative and referendums and recalls being uh, adopted locally and st- on state level. You have the 17th Amendment, which is the direct election of senators, and the 19th Amendment, which gives female suffrage, women's suffrage. Alice Paul! Let's talk about World War I. America was initially neutral. Uh, they will enter under Wilson in order to make the world safer democracy. What really causes America to enter is uh, cause to enter World War I was the unrestricted submarine warfare. Uh, some Americans will die when the Germans sink a British ship, the Lusitania, in 1915. Uh, after that, the Germans will do the Sussex Pledge. They'll stop uh, doing submarine, unrestricted submarine warfare. In 1917, they're going for a last grasp of victory. And they're going to stop. They're going to start doing submarine warfare again. They were hoping they could do that and win the war before the Americans send soldiers overseas. Uh, also, we uh, caught the German Zimmerman note which is where Germany was encouraging Mexico to attack the United States. And in return, they can get the land they lost in the Mexican-American War. Uh, Domestically, life will change in World War I. There will be restrictions on civil liberties. We'll have the Espionage and and Sedition Act. The Supreme Court will uphold some of these things, like Schneck v. United States. There will be increased opportunities for women and African-Americans to work in factories. You have the Great Migration, which is, this is like, the Great Migration starts in the mm, late 1800s. It really reaches this po- like key point in World War I. The big part of the Great Migration is like usually like 1910 to like 1920s. But the Great Migration all, goes all the way from like 1890 to 1970. Uh, you have African Americans moving to the North. After World War I, there will be the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, remember Brat, uh, the Treaty of Versailles is going to be a treaty based on uh, revenge. It's going to, Germany has to do the war guilt clause, blame Germany. They have to pay reparations. They have to get rid of their arms. So they have to get rid of their Navy and their Air Force and reduce their army to 100,000. And they lose territory. They lose all their colonies and they lose some land in Europe. The one thing Wilson got it from the Treaty of Versailles was the League of Nations. But when he went home, to uh, try to get Congress to approve the Treaty of Versailles, the Republicans and the Irreconcilables, who are the Republicans that did not want this, who are isolationist, they're going to vote against the League of Nations and the Treaty of Versailles, and America will never join. Wilson's 14 points will influence the treaty, kind of. <laughs> like, Wilson's 14 points, like, the big thing that, It's in the Treaty of Versailles that's from the 14 points is the idea of uh, the League of Nations. The problem with the League of Nations is it has no army and the United States never joins. Uh, The 14 points was very idealistic. It talked about freedom and self-determination for colonies, but Britain and France don't want to give freedom to their own colonies, so they're going to ignore a lot of those parts of the 14 points. 
Ultimately, America will join, not join the League of Nations. Oh, well, there's George Washington. Uh, yes, you did, George. Yes, you did. All right, let's continue. Let's talk about the 1920s. In the 1920s, uh, at the end of World War I, there'll be a communist revolution in Russia. Uh, this is going to lead to a fear in America of communism coming abroad and trying to take over the country. This is called the Red Scare, or we usually call it the First Red Scare. Uh, this was caused by the uh, Russian Revolution and labor unrest. Uh, there was things like Palmer raids, where the uh, Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer, is going to arrest and try to deport immigrants and radicals, some of them that were U.S. citizens. Uh, one of the other examples of the, uh, they use the Espionage and Sedition Act to do some of the stuff that they're doing. Some of the other examples are like uh, the Sacco and Vincetti trial, where they were uh, accused of murder. What we know now is one of them probably was guilty and one of them was innocent, but really there wasn't a lot of evidence against them. It was all circumstantial, and they were really convicted for their beliefs and their ethnicity. In the 1920s, there will be quota acts passed. There will be the Emergency Quota Act of 1921, which limited like Southern and Eastern Europeans. It created a quota system. Only 3% of the immigrants coming to America could be from Southern or Eastern Europe. And you have the Immigration Act of 1924, which actually reduced it even more to 2%. It also banned uh, people from Asian countries from coming to the United States. So this is when America is going to start to use quotas against certain ethnicities. Yuck. This was highly restrictive. It was aimed at new immigrants for the quotas. The Chinese, they just, and the Japanese, they just would not allow in the country to begin with. There will be new time uh, technology in the 1920s. We have uh, improved standards of living, like things like the refrigerator, the radio. We have cheap automobiles like the uh, Model T car from Henry Ford, better communication systems, new types of music like jazz. There's going to be a lot of cultural and political conflicts in the 1920s. You have the ideas of tradition versus innovation, fundamentalist Christianity versus scientific modernism. You see this in the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, native borns versus new immigrants. You see this in the Quota Acts. White versus blacks. You see this in the Red Summer. The Red Summer was a period in 1919, 1919 when... Uh, bunch of racial violence against African Americans, white supremacism, terrorism, and racial riots are going to occur the more, in more than three dozen cities across the United States. Uh, it's one of the largest examples of racial violence in America. Uh, there is a lot of backlash uh, towards the whole Great Migration. A lot of whites in the North are angry uh, that blacks are moving to the North because they're afraid they're going to lose their jobs. So the KKK actually starts to become much more popular in the North now. And this is where you uh, start to see a lot of racial violence, even in Northern cities against African-Americans. Idealism versus dis disillusionment. This is like, for example, the lost generation, F. Scott Fitzgerald. You do have cultural positive things like the uh, Harlem Renaissance, which is a uh, celebration of African-American culture through art, writing, and music, Langston Hughes, parts of jazz, Louis Armstrong. Next up is the Great Depression and the New Deal. The Great Depression is going to be the greatest economic threat America faced in its history. Uh, unemployment will go up to around 30% at its very highest. Usually it uh, peaked around 25%. Uh, it was caused because of Black Tuesday when the banks started uh, when uh, the stock market prices started to crash on Black Tuesday, this is going to cause a lot of banks to crash, the whole banking crisis, because banks were loaning out money for stocks because stocks were really good in the 1920s. Uh, like People were buying on margin and buying on credit. Uh, so banks are going to start to collapse. People are going to lose their life savings. Companies will collapse. Uh, farmers were overproducing at this time. It's just a, a whirlwind of badness. The Great Depression is going to lead to a call for stronger financial regulatory system. Herbert Hoover, who was president, who was a Republican, did believed in laissez-faire, so he did not want to do that. So in 1933, Franklin Delano Roosevelt will be elected president, and he's going to implement the New Deal. Much of the New Deal is going to uh, 
be really pushed during his first 100 days, the 100 days, the first 100 days of his presidency, where he's going to have Congress pass a plethora of legislation. A lot of the New Deal will either focus on relief, recovery, or reform. They're going to use earlier progressive ideas. There will be challenges to the New Deal. Uh, so, for example, the Supreme Court is going to rule against some of the New Deal legislation, like the AAA, uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And in return, FDR wants to pack the Supreme Court and appoint new justices. And actually, this is going to turn some Democrats to turn against him because they think he's gone too far. There were radicals in the Democratic Party that were even more radical than uh, FDR, like Huey Long, who was the governor of Louisiana and was a big-time populist and low-key was a dictator. There he is right here. <laughs> uh, the New Deal is going to create a legacy of reform and new agencies and laws. This is where you get Social Security. This is where you get the FDIC. So if the bank collapses, the government will pay you back up to a certain amount. Uh, the New Deal created laws uh, to give people jobs immediately, like the CCC, which gave young people jobs. The NYA gave teenagers jobs. Uh, it did a lot of things. The New Deal did help reduce the Great Depression, but it's not going to be until World War II that the Great Depression is fully killed. Was that Henry Clay? Oh my God, this guy never dies. What you're going to see in this time period is you are going to see political realignment. African Americans are going to start to vote for Democrats, and African Americans have never voted for Democrats before because the Democrats are the party of the South and racism. But this is, uh, especially after the election of 1936, one of the midterms, this is when you really start to see African-Americans voting for Democrats because some of FDR's programs did help out African-Americans. Unions had always supported the Democrats, so they continue to do this, but this is like the New Deal coalition. Let's talk about World War II now. America was neutral until Pearl Harbor, although we did try to get involved as much as possible. FDR definitely wanted to help out Great Britain. So he does things like the destroyer deal, cash and carry, and the Lend-Lease to try to help out as much as possible. But a lot of Americans were very isolationist until then. When, when America gets involved in the war, there will be mass mobilization of the economy. This will end the Great Depression. There's going to be opportunities for women and minorities. This is where you get Rosie the Riveter. The uh, ideal of the women at the time, Rosie the Riveter. In the 1800s, we had the cult of domesticity. Uh... After the American Revolution, we had the Republican Motherhood. During the Gilded Age, we had the Gibson Girl. 1920s, we had the Flapper. Uh, and now we have Rosie the Riveter. Wartime experiences. America, to their utter shame, is going to do Executive Order 9066, which is going to put Japanese in internment camps, which is a nice way of saying concentration camps. A lot of the Japanese will not be able to pay their mortgages for their houses because they're in a freaking internment camp, and they're going to lose everything they owned after World War II. It's not till the 1970s that the United States apologizes to the Japanese Americans for what we did. There was not a group of disloyalty in this country. Uh, Japanese Americans uh, got more medals of honor than any other ethnicity per person. Like if you look at like the amount of people and then the total population of them, they served their country with patriotism. But a lot of racism against Japanese people, very unfounded, and that's going to lead to Japanese internment. Uh, there's going to be debate over race and segregation. Uh, during the Civil War, people like A. Philip Randolph, who was the big civil rights leader in the 1930s and 1940s, is going to do the double V campaign. We'll fight to end Nazism in Europe. And when we come back, we want to end the fascism and racism in the South. There was racism against Mexicans uh, during World War II. One of the most famous examples is the Zoot Suit Riots where a bunch of sailors in uh, Los Angeles in 1943 started beating up Mexicans who were wearing zoot suits because they thought they were unpatriotic because they were using too much cloth. America is going to drop the atomic bomb to end the war with Japan in August against Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The argument was this was meant to save lives and end the war quickly. Why did America and their allies win World War II? Uh, they are democratic countries. Commitment to 
uh, democracy. They did have technological advancements and more better technology over time. Really, the big thing is industrial production. They had a much stronger industrial production, and it got worse and worse for Germany as the war was going. After World War II, America will emerge as the most powerful nation. Europe is going to be in ruins. European law is in ruins, and Europe lays in ruins. Uh, and America's going to need to help rebuild, rebuild Europe. Some of the key people from this time period, Frederick Jackson Turner, he did the Turner thesis. He argued the frontier was closed. This leads to overseas expansion. Alfred Thayer Mahan, he wrote The Influence of Sea Power Upon U.S. History. He argued for countries to build navies. Rudyard Kipling, he was the one that did the poem The White Man's Burden, which justified imperialism using race. Theodore Roosevelt, uh, he was uh, the secretary, assistant secretary of the Navy. He's going to resign, and he's going to fight in the Spanish-American War. Uh, he was one of the commanders, Colonel Roosevelt, at the Battle of San Juan Hill. He becomes vice president and will later become president. William McKinley was president during the Spanish-American War. He'll be assassinated. Emilio Aguilando was the Filipino that fought with America at first, but then when we did not honor their idea of independence, he's going to lead a rebellion against the United States. The Anti-Imperialist League was an organization formed uh, to try to go uh, push against the Spanish-American War and really push against the treaty and the acquisition of the Philippines, the Treaty of Paris, which was in 1899-1900. Other key people from the Progressive Era, Upton Sinclair, he wrote The Jungle, which talked about the uh, inhumane and gross and unsanitary conditions for meat factories. Jacob Reese, How the Other Half Lives, which was a picture book that showed photography of like the horrible living conditions in the inner cities for new immigrants. Lincoln Steffens wrote Shame of Cities, which kind of talked about the political corruptions of senators and like political machines. Alice Paul is going to fight for women's suffrage. She forms the National Women's P Party and she helps the 19th Amendment get passed. My girl! John Muir is going to found the Sierra Club, uh, which is one of the first preservationist clubs in America for uh, the environment. In World War I, uh, Wilson will campaign that he kept us out of war, but he will get us involved in World War I. He's going to enter the war, what he would say is for humanitarian and democratic principles. George Creel, uh, He's going to lead the Committee of Public Information. He was originally a journalist, but he's going to join the Wilson administration and basically lead the propaganda during World War I. Charles Schneck was a person that was arrested under the Espionage and Sedition Act. This is where you get the Supreme Court case, Schneck v. U.S., and they say it is okay to arrest somebody, even though it kind of violates the Bill of Rights, if what they say will cause a clear and present danger. Henry Cabot Lodge is one of the leaders of the Reconcil Reconcilables for the Republicans, and he was against the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations. A. Mitchell Palmer, uh, Attorney General under Woodrow Wilson, who will do the uh, Red Scare Palmer raids. We have the Harlem Renaissance in this time period, celebration of African culture uh, through music and literature. You have Langston Hughes, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, both authors. Marcus Garvey, who formed the UNIA, he promoted African Americans to move back to Africa. He will influence people like Malcolm X. John T. Scopes in the 1920s was a scientist, a science teacher, who's going to teach evolution. He'll be tried by Tennessee. This is where you get the Scopes monkey trial, which shows the whole uh, conflict between fundamentalism versus modernism. You have the lost generation authors who criticize middle-class consumerism, and the superficiality of American life. For the Great Depression and New Deal, you have the Bonus Army. Uh, these were World War I vets that wanted their bonus early, and Hoover's going to send the army against them. It makes them look really bad. FDR's New Deal had the three R's, Relief, Recovery, Reform. Dr. Towns, uh, Francis Talchad uh, advocated giving $200 per month to the elderly. This is one of the ideas that FDR will take when he creates Social Security. 
you are going to see political realignment. African Americans and working class people are going to start to vote more and more Democrats after the Great Depression. Sometimes this is called the New Deal Coalition. In World War II, we have A. Philip Randolph. He proposed a march on Washington. This is going to lead to FDR desegregating defense industries, not the army, but defense industries, so like factories that government controls. Women will work in factories, Rosie the Riveter. So we have seen in this class like the progressive change of women's roles over time. African Americans will work in factories. The fight in the war, they're going to come back and they want to have the double V campaign. That was led by groups like CORE. More than 100,000 Japanese will be put in internment camps during World War II. Mexicans, uh, some Mexicans will migrate to America to work in the fields, the Bracero program. However, there will be racism against Mexicans, Mexican-Americans, like the Zoot Suit riots in Los Angeles in 1943. All right, kiddos. And that is all for this unit. That's all I have for you for today. Until next time. Do, 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 deuces. Deuces, deuces, yeah.